one of the greatest challenges we face as Christians is to manage our self-life. We need to remember it's not about us, it's about him. That's hard for us to grasp, I know. When we think too much about ourselves and what's happening to us and what we want to do, then we lose interest in caring about what God wants. And we lose interest in caring for others. Overcoming our selfies, so to speak, is one of the most important activities of the Christian life. We believers in the scripture are told to be overcomers. The biblical word for overcome is nekeo. At root, it means to conquer or to prevail. It appears 20 times in the New Testament and mostly in the Revelation. It is also the name of the Greek goddess of victory, Nike. Does that sound familiar? The word was used by Greeks to describe a battle scene where one force overcomes another. In other words, a victory is won. In a very real sense, we believers in Jesus Christ are good soldiers. We are called to overcome the enemy. And what or who is the enemy? Paul writes to the Romans, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then John writes in the second chapter, I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. Are you listening? And you have overcome the evil one. It's a promise. We have the victory. The evil one is the enemy. He is the devil, the tempter, the accuser, Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call him. And he is prevailing in this world because he's still at war with God. And we are non-compliant, non-combatants that are caught up in this terrible war that's going on. You see, the evil one, the tempter, the accuser, he's out to cause us to doubt, to tempt us to sin, and to rob us of our joy. You see, the devil's fingerprints all over bad influences all around us. We don't have to believe in the devil because this is what is preached or the church teaches. You just have to believe in the devil because Jesus did, remember? Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus was all the time dealing with the evil one because that's the battle that is going on. And we are no different because we share in the Lord's mission to bring the kingdom of God on the earth. But there's going to be resistance. We see the devil's fingerprints in jealousies and anger and hatred and malice and lying and deceit, envy, evil intent, and unforgiveness. The evil one's most destructive presence is found not out there in the world at large, but in us, in the battle of our minds. Why do you think Paul tells us in Ephesians, Ephesians to put on the helmet of salvation? The head is the most critical aspect of the human body. You get hit in the head and you're out. What is the helmet? The helmet of salvation. It's the knowledge that God loves us. He's paid the price for our sins and redeemed. Glory, hallelujah. That protects our head where the devil wants to do his work. The evil one's destructive presence is all around us. And the battle is very loud and near. We remember Peter uh, walking on the water and sinking. We remember Jesus' words to Peter saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Overcoming requires a stalwart faith in God and a decreasing interest in self. 
Peter trusted Jesus when the Lord said, come. But he trusted himself to walk on the water. Do you understand the difference? If you think about yourself too much, you are sure to ruin your ability to be an overcomer. I like to remember the story of the centipede. You know, one of those little wormy creatures with all the legs? He was rapidly walking along the garden path, and he met an ant. And the ant said, oh my, Mr. Centipede, how I admire your ability to make all those legs work together. And the ant went on his way, and the centipede went on his way. And then the centipede started to think about it, if a centipede can think. And the first thing you know, he was laying in the ditch with all those legs waving in the air, unable to walk at all. And the ant came back by, and he looked in the ditch, and he says, well, I guess six legs are better than a hundred. And the ant went on his way, and he began to think about it, if an ant can think. And the next thing you know, he was in the ditch, too, with his legs waving in the air. Thinking can get us in the trouble. But it's one of the characteristics of being a human being that we think. And sometimes we think too much. And in fact, when we start thinking, we leave the Lord out of it. That's a major mistake. And it's a major tragedy. You see, when you come right down to it, we're our worst enemy. Oh, the devil's an enemy, and he's out there working. But when we start thinking, we do damage to ourselves. You say, well, pastor, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I think I'm supposed to be reasonable, and I'm supposed to put things together in a logical way. Of course, we do that at work, especially if we have a physical job where we're building things. We have to put the nuts on the bolts. God doesn't do that for us. But when we become convinced that what we're doing is all on us, then we miss the point of the New Testament. Who keeps your heart beating? Who draws the breath that you take? Who keeps your body functioning? Who provides you the materials to do the work that you do? It's God Almighty. You see, if we're going to be overcomers, we can overcome only through the power and majesty of God in us. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew, That he was, he said, from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And he raised up on the third day, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Did you hear it? What are we setting our interests on? Listen, we all know, like the video said, that in the world we're going to have tribulation. But we need to remember the rest of that verse in John 16, 33. In the world you have tribulation, but rejoice, take joy, keep your joy, for I have overcome the world. And Jesus is not talking about conquering all of the difficulties around us or maybe even making things right. He's talking about the main victory of overcoming the world, that in your head, God's first. Not me, Lord, but you. That, that has to be the modus operandi of our lives. It's hard to understand because it's a matter of faith. It's, it's something that we almost have to learn. Later, you remember Peter blurted out to Jesus when Jesus said that he'd deny him, and he said, not me, Lord, never me. 
But when fear overcame him, and Peter started thinking about it, he denied Christ three times. You see, self gets in the way of overcoming because our personal worries alienate us from God, the rock of our salvation. And when we were visiting a while back in the jail, I'll, I'll always remember this one inmate saying to us, I do believe in God, but when I start thinking about the law, what it can do to me, I get scared. Do you hear that? Oh, I do believe. Remember the father whose son was thrown in the fire by the... Oh, I do believe, but help thou me in my unbelief. What are you thinking about? You know, there's some strange things happening right now. We prayed for our president just a few minutes ago. What are you thinking? You see, we begin to, to manufacture the story the way we want it told. We begin to think about things the way we want them to happen. Instead of praying as Jesus did, even in the garden, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. That is the majesty of faith. That is what we're called to as Christians. We're called to put ourselves in the hands of God. You say, but, but I'm strong, us men especially, I see this. I'm strong, Lord, I can do this. I'm out there on the ranch, you know. I'm out there cutting the trees. Some of you were out and cut trees this last week, watching them fall. Boom, oh, that's cool. You know, we got all this power and the strength and everything, and we, we, we get excited about what we've done. But who's really done it? I'm not trying to create a fantasy here. Listen, we're all practical people, right? We understand if we drive too fast and we lose control of the car, we crash. We understand that. We understand if we step off a cliff, it's going to hurt when we hit the ground. We understand that we keep our fingers out of machinery. We understand all of these things around us. But do we understand the basic New Testament principle? to put our faith in God. You see, we're in a very challenging time. Maybe it's no more so than it was back in, in the previous centuries. Maybe, maybe the people during the Civil War years had to exercise this again and begin to think about, is our nation going to survive, and, and what can we do, and, and God be merciful. Maybe they were doing the same thing that we're doing. But the point is, that we have to overcome ourselves. That's our primary objective. Jesus taught us, don't worry about your life, your food, your drink, your clothes, or your future. That's what he taught us in Matthew chapter 6. It turns out that the late Charles Schultz, the creator of the comic strip Peanuts, had a self problem. He once told Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show that in high school he failed at everything and that he was chronically lonely. And let's not forget that Schultz was a confessing Christian and his strip is filled with Christian theology and language. Charlie Brown, Schultz's alter ego, is the epitome of rejection and loneliness. In one strip, Schultz has Charlie say, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> Meek, resentful, lonely, and unhappy little Charlie Brown dwells on himself. Strangely, even when Schultz was making $4,000 a day at the height of his career, he was still living in his discouraged self. David Michaelis, his biographer, says of Schultz at the end of his 655-page book, Nothing in all of his 77 years had been resolved. Think about it. Pray about it. Think about it. Surrender to God. Don't confuse yourself by thinking too much. Be open to God and the Spirit leading you and guiding you. 
That's part of our heritage as Christians, is that we trust the spirit and the power and majesty of God to lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's what the Bible says. So what can we do about it? Just as in the problem of overcoming doubt by faith, we need to hang on to our faith that God loves us and he knows better what's good for us and we can trust him at his word. Did you hear that? Trust him at his word. When God says in the word to have faith in him, that's what he means. When he says that whatever you pray, believe that you have it and it will be so. We can trust God at his word. We can trust God when he tells us <clears throat> that he has a place for us in heaven, that he cares for us. We can trust him when he tells us that he wants us to have abundant life. Stop thinking about it. Stop creating problems up here in your head and start living from the heart. That's what the Hebrews did. They lived from the heart. I think of little old Gideon. Gideon is out there at the bottom of the wine press, which was essentially a hole in the ground, thrashing grain, and he's down there so that the Midianites wouldn't see him thrashing the grain and come and steal it from him. The angel of the Lord came to him and said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. I can almost see him laughing. Sounds pretty inflating, egocentric. <clears throat> but this is what Gideon replied, O oh my Lord, if the Lord God is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Have you ever asked that of yourself? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Gideon's thinking. He's not exercising faith. And he even ignored the fact that it was an angel bringing this message to him. Wouldn't that startle us? And he denied the history of his people that God has been with them and worked with them and looked over them. It's the eternal mistake of self. We convince ourselves that things are the way they are. And that's it. What it is is what it is. How often have we heard that? What it is is what it is. Where's the faith in that? Where's the hope in that? Where's the promise in that? That's men thinking. And most poisonous in this respect is pronouncing curses on yourself. Oh, when we visited in the jail in the past and listened to these guys and some of their testimonies, well, I'm a drug addict, I'm always gonna be a drug addict. Or I'm an alcoholic, or I'm this, or I'm that. What does God say you are? Stop thinking and put some energy into what he says. He says, in me, you're a child of God. We have the promise and the victory in him. That's what the scripture says. And we need to claim that. Now, when the cloud settles around you, don't get frightened and don't get anxious. Just begin to pray, Lord, thank you for answering my prayers. Lord, thank you for blessing me. Lord, thank you for bringing about prosperity and well-being in my life. Is there anybody here that doesn't have any food in the refrigerator right now? Raise your hand if that's the case. I don't see any hands. Do you realize that three quarters of the world don't have food in the refrigerator right now? They don't even have refrigerators, some of them. You see, we're eternally blessed. So let's not think ourselves into a corner. Let's praise God and thank him and bless him for all that he's done for us. Because we're overcomers, right? We're not failures. We're overcomers. And that's what the scripture calls us to be. Praise God. Sigmund Freud was a German Jew, although not religious. He named the three parts of human personality as the id, ego, and superego. Actually, in German, he merely called them the it, the I, and the over-I. It was Freud's translator, James Stacey, who brought them into English as the id, ego, and superego. 
The word ego, or I, is actually from the first person singular pronoun in Latin, and it is the part of the human personality that is responsible for dealing with reality. Freud has given too much credit for his analysis since the Bible already speaks about this. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that we're body, soul, and spirit. Same thing. The soul is the I or the ego, the body is the it or the id, and the spirit is the over it or the superego. Conflict arises between the id and the superego. Conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And that's what Jesus talked about. You see, one of these things is going to be in control. That's the way it is on planet Earth. And when we become overcomers, what we do is we shift the emphasis from the way we feel and what our body is doing to the spirit and what God has promised to us. Put it very simply from Romans chapter 8. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh can not please God. Wow. Most of us recognize fleshiness as being a bad attribute. And we constantly try to avoid it, but it's always there crouching at the door. For example, is Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for many. Jesus gave over the flesh. The Lord taught us what was important. He showed us by example. The Bible says Jesus emptied himself of power, taking on the form of a bondservant so that he could be our savior. His example of selflessness should encourage us all to stop thinking so much about ourselves. You know, I, I just had an impression from the Spirit. There's some people here right now in this chapel who have health issues, who have financial problems, who are struggling with, I, I just sense it, and you're, 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 you're fighting with me. Uh, but, but this is so important. If I don't do this, I'm going to be out to lunch. I'm going to be lost. No, you aren't. God is able. We have to know that and believe that. You say, but pastor, my problem is so huge. No, it isn't. The problem is solvable because we put our faith and trust in God. You say, well, if I'm going to be out on the street... You know, then I've lost. Well, are you going to be out on the street or is God going to take care of you? How did you reach this point in your life? How come you're still alive? Think about the times that you should have gone home to heaven, but you didn't. Personally, it was about three times for me that I almost bought the farm. What are we doing to ourselves? We need to be overcomers. We don't need to be losers. And yet, that's what life teaches us. We need to get out of the way. <clears throat> there are then several things that we can do to be overcomers. First, we've got to learn to die to self. Right here in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, yet not I. The life I now live is in Christ. You see, there has to be a personal sacrifice to get rid of self. Secondly, we need to have faith in God, not ourselves, and that was Peter's problem. Faith in God and not ourselves. And third, we need to confess those things that annoy us and cause us to feel rejected. Above all, stop typing yourself a certain way. Well, I'm a loser, or I'm an alcoholic, or I'm financially distressed, or I'm this, or I'm that. We've got to trust God for who we are and what's going on in our lives. You know, we quote Romans 8.28, for everything works together for good to those that love God or are called according to his purpose. We all know that. We quote that. But we get in a tight spot and we forget it. 
Personally, I'm getting a little tired of having health issues. I had a hip replacement. I had hernia surgery. Uh, I, I had a cataract replacement. I'm thinking, I'm tired of going to the doctor. I'm tired of all this stuff. You know, I'm fed up. But wait a minute. Thank God for the technology and the services that permitted that to happen. You can remember when I limp back and forth on this stage. You know, I get up, hurts like the dickens. And so God provides a way. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. You see, that has to be our mindset. If we have a mindset that is negative and destructive of ourselves, if we see ourselves in a way that we aren't, that is against the will and power of God. Doesn't he say in 1 Thessalonians, in all things giving thanks? Everything give thanks. And then it, the scripture says, for this is God's will for you. And then we need to have a heavenly view. Perhaps this is most important for all of us. My scripture says in Colossians 1.27, Christ Jesus, our hope of glory. We, we hope in him. He's in us. So we have to have a heavenly view. In other words, let's look over this travail that we're in now and realize that there's a place to go, that Jesus told us about it. And that's the reality that we're looking at. This is not real. This is an illusion. It's a time of training. You say, well, it sure feels like it's real. <laughs> but what's really real? What Jesus told us about. The glory that God has for us in heaven. And finally, we need to learn to live in the sufficiency of God's grace. What does that mean? Exactly what he told Paul when Paul was whining and complaining about his thorn in the flesh. God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Oh, how we men hate that. <laughs> I don't want to appear weak. I want to appear strong. I want to appear like I'm able to defend myself and what's mine. You understand what I'm saying? But who's in control here? When I'm talking like that and I'm thinking like that, I'm thinking the devil's work. I should be thinking, thank you, Lord, for your presence and your victory in my life. Thank you for giving me hope and well-being. Thank you for answering my prayers. Thank you for being my God. Well, then Paul writes, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Finally, love God, trust him at his word, believe him, and get out of the way. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, thank you for the majesty of your word. May you be blessed and praised in all things in our lives. May you take preeminence. And may your kingdom come in us and on earth as you so desire. In Jesus' holy name, amen.